and let's go from current slide. Now, let's uh, take just a little bit of time at the beginning to make a couple of observations. This is one of my, certainly the class that's doing the best with labs and tests, getting things done and stuff like this, and yet, and yet, I have received, is it zero papers? Zero papers? Any of you turn in a research paper yet? Please, folks, don't, don't forget, this is the last month of the term right now, you know, July. Of course, it's still very early in July, but please don't forget. I was planning on turning mine in on Thursday. That'll be great, okay? Uh, lab one, everybody turned in. Test one, everybody finished and turned in. I've returned all those back to you. Lab two, all but one, turned that in. Uh, and test two, everybody did. I got that back to you. Test uh, lab three, one person is finished and turned it in. That's the moon lab. So keep working on that. And the moon's been out there. So I hope you've been making observations. Test three, Two people haven't finished that, so I can't return that yet. Lab four, one, two, three people haven't done that, turned that in yet. I may have gotten one of them today, I did, okay? And then test four, one person hasn't done. Uh, lab five, I've only got two of those back, but I got a couple more today. I've got portions of it back, so. That was the last one we did. That's the one with density of igneous rocks. You know, we weighed the rocks and took the, yeah, and and then it had the questions with it. Yeah, only two people turned it down. But let's see, you may have been one of them. Yes, you did. Wait, no. Yeah, you you turned it in. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Okay, Ties came in. Good to see you. It's so pretty outside today. What's that? Oh, it is. I bet you it's warm, though. It's warm, but the wind is blowing. That's nice. Has the humidity dropped a little bit? Okay, they said tomorrow was supposed to be very humid, but I didn't know. They said there were chances of rain today, but uh, it sure doesn't look like it much now. Maybe later. Good deal. Thank you. So another test uh, lab five came out. Now, did you get a lab five? You weren't here, were you? Uh, I think you were the only one to have to you'll pass that over to him. Okay. Um, a lot of people haven't turned it in yet, so if you get with them, maybe you can get the data. You can hear a lot of it. In fact, I think you can hear most of it. I didn't get that. What's that? I didn't get it. You didn't get it, or you did? No, I didn't get it. You didn't? Okay, that's yours. Okay. Um, there are only ten parts to it, and I think you can hear it all on on, on uh, YouTube, okay? And the other 15 parts, the questions, you can do on your own, and that's all on YouTube too, so you might be able to get it all done. I mean, you have to answer the questions, but you can hear the instructions for which questions to answer that kind of stuff. So, uh, so you might be able to get it all done without seeing somebody else's, but because uh, I tried to repeat everything that was being done, so it would be hurt. Okay, I marked you here, so I think we're ready to go. I was just going over the things, and I didn't get to test five, but two people didn't take it. Uh, you, because you weren't here, and the other person who did a makeup on an earlier test. Also, did you test five? What's that? Yeah, oh, y'all did test five. Last one. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay, good deal. All right, any questions on anything so far? What's that? Okay. All right. Uh, you don't need to 
places to go. Those two questions are going to just I thought of these two to put in on track. But you probably are doing things independently on another sheet. All right, we started in chapter 19 last time, which is building the Earth's surface. Uh, and that doesn't sound like it's building, but really it does contribute to building. Uh, you think of earthquakes as destroying it, but it actually is part of the building. So this is as uh, uh, Jessica said, 19.3 uh, earthquakes. So what is an earthquake? Okay, we talked about the stresses and strains, right? The stresses are the forces, and the strains are the reactions of those forces. And some of those strains are sudden giving away, breaking, fracturing, or things like this. When that happens somewhere deep down in the mantle or the crust, somewhere that something gives way after stressing, sometimes for decades, or even centuries. The plates are moving so slowly, but they've been under pressure, and something's holding it up, and then suddenly when something releases suddenly, we have an earthquake. The quaking, shaking, vibrating upheaval of the ground, okay? Most of the time, the ground is an upheaval too much, but you know, uh, mostly it's the shaking and vibrating. It results from that sudden release of energy from the stress on the rocks. The rocks are, you know, the boundaries between these plates are not smooth, slit, oiled, you know, not, you know, they're jagged, they're, they're messy, and they stick to each other, they just have trouble moving past each other, and when they do suddenly release, that's when we have an earthquake. The vibrations are your seismic waves, okay, remember? What two types of Actually, three types of seismic waves do we have? Okay. I heard surface waves and what? Waves. Okay, okay. Well, it's through solids, liquids, and gases to some extent, but the transverse waves or shear waves, secondary waves, they go only through solids, okay, not through liquids, okay? So those are the seismic waves that the vibrations travel through. Then when they reach the surface, you get the surface waves. All right. It's Cassidy, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> most of these earthquakes, most, not all, occur along these fault planes. That makes sense, doesn't it? When one side is displaced with respect to the other. Now, this doesn't have to be the plate boundaries. Any fault line that you have, when something is being displaced, trying to be displaced, but it's hung up, and then suddenly releases, that's going to create an earthquake. Okay? Now, a lot of times these are along the plate boundaries, but they don't have to be. What are the causes of these earthquakes? One of those is the elastic rebound theory. Now remember of the strains, remember we have stresses which are the forces, strains which are the reactions of those forces. These, one of those is the elastic rebound, okay? Let's say that the rock is holding it up, holding it up, and then suddenly it slips past and rebounds back to its original shape. That's an elastic strain, okay? And that would be the elastic rebound theory. Two plates press tightly together, friction restricts the motion, the stress builds up and builds up and builds up until suddenly the friction of the rock, and now, now they're, they've crossed some things up here. This is called elastic rebound. Down here, they say, it actually, the rock ruptures. Strength is overcome, 
the rock rushes your strength is overcome, the stress rock suddenly snaps into a new position. Well, that's the elliptic rebound. Okay? Um, but they say the rupture strength is overcome, that means it actually breaks or ruptures. Okay? So you've got two things going on here. Elastic rebound with fracture. Okay? Both of those are happening here. Though it will set definitely cause an earthquake. Okay? One of the most famous lines, especially in the U.S., is this San Andreas Fault. Okay? You may have heard of it before. It's, in fact, I have a theory, I don't know if it's true or not. Get my globe. It's an unusually striking feature just below California. It's part of Mexico. Uh, it's called the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay? It's a tiny little strip of land that goes down like this with the bay, and this is even in the U.S., but the cap title of it is the Bay of California that comes up here. Actually, the Gulf of California. It comes all the way up there, separating that strip of land from the rest of Mexico. It is connected at the top, but it's a huge gulf, not as big as the Gulf of Mexico, but a long, skinny gulf there, separating the, uh, did I call it Yucatan? Yucatan Peninsula is over here. It's the uh, Baja, Baja Peninsula, B-A-J-A, -A -B -A -A, Baja Peninsula. In California and Mexico, separated by the Gulf of California. Now, it looks like to me that may be there because of the San Andreas Fault. I just wonder if sometime in the past there was a pretty major eruption there. Now, I don't know this for a fact, it just looks like that's where it is heading down here, straight into the Gulf of California. But, the bad news for us is it's over land here, okay? And it's run smack through San Francisco. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the San Francisco earthquake. It was about 1900 or so, plus or minus a few years on either side of 1900. Um, remember in 1849, that's when gold was discovered in California, and they had the 49ers, you know, the, the gold rush of 49. And, I mean, people just started swarming out there. And San Francisco sprung up, up, up almost overnight as a very major city. Uh, it was built quickly. Uh, wooden structures, temporary acting and stuff like this. It just grew like crazy. And then, you know, 50 years later, they had this really massive earthquake. Now, the infrastructure was there. You had uh, natural gas lines all over the place. They had, you know, things. And when that earthquake hit, it was major. Now, it wasn't really that big of an earthquake, but it broke gas lines. It broke all sorts of things. Houses burst into flames. Actually, the fire got most of the city, not the earthquake. And it was just a total total mess, okay? Uh, now, again, here's a theory of mine. My theory is the whole San Francisco Bay probably is a result or has to do with that same fault line. That's the San Andreas fault, okay? Now, it was a World Series back in the late 80s or early 90s, I believe it was. San Francisco Giants had won the National League and the Oakland uh, Athletics had won the American League. So this was the, uh, the Bay Bridge World Series. They were right across the, the bridge from each other, right across San Francisco Bay from each other. 
and they were actually playing a game, I think in San Francisco, when they had another earthquake. Now this one probably wasn't as big, and it certainly wasn't as major as the one back in the 1900s, okay, early 1900s, but it was still big enough, yeah. This fall, one plate moving one way, one moving another. What's going on? I you know, saying actually, it might sink into the ocean. Yeah. That part right there is going to really take into effect without it being that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and there are definitely, there's a crack there. In fact, your book has a picture that is absolutely incredible to me of uh, showing the, the movement of the thing. But it's movement, it's not falling off, it's movement. It might be separated. Huh? It might be separated. No, there's very little time to separate. Where the separation occurs is in the middle of the Atlantic, where that mid-oceanic rift is. That's some separation. Iceland's on that, but it's not what happens when it separates, lava comes out. I mean, it's not that you have a big hole. That's Hollywood, okay? <laughs> That's not reality. But everything is going to look inside you. They're going to die, right? Not necessarily, okay? The... Uh, where you have the earthquake, sure, there is major building collapse and things like this. Haiti, oh my goodness, they had an earthquake there and their structures were really poor, okay? They were concrete, thatch, you know, things like this. Buildings collapse, you know, things like this. Okay, this Bay Bridge, the one during the World Series. Uh, the reason it's called Bay Bridge, there is a major connection between the, um, the eastern side of, of San Francisco Bay and San Francisco itself. And uh, Oakland and Alameda are here, and across the bay is, is San Francisco. There's a major bridge there, and it's called the Bay Bridge. San Francisco Bay Bridge. Now, the Golden Gate Bridge is here at the entrance. This is connecting the, the land masses, okay? Now, the Bay Bridge had one lane of traffic, I mean several lanes of traffic going one way, and on top of it several going the other way, okay? And right in the middle of that was an island called Gerbo Bueno Island. That means uh, good herbs, you know, nice, growthy, really a pretty island. And right in that island, they put a, a tunnel through. So it was the Bay Bridge Tunnel, okay? And that's about midway through in the bay, and so you came from Oakland this way, the island here, and then you went on to San Francisco that way. But on both sides, it was eastbound, westbound, on top of each other. I mean, one above the other. I don't remember which was on top and which was on bottom, eastbound, westbound. But that major connector, the major connection between San Francisco side of the bay and the mainland side of the bay, that major connection, when that earthquake happened, the top plate fell down on the bottom. And anybody who was driving on the lower part, good chance they were either killed or their car crushed. It, it, it was a mess. It was a big, terrible mess. And I remember it was the late 80s, early 90s, because I was working for Southern Research Institute. We happened to be down in Florida uh, working with a guy there from FAMU. Uh, Florida A&M University, who was working on code. He was an architect working on code things for, for radon research. And we were at a uh, restaurant, and the TVs were on. We were sitting around talking, and then the, suddenly interrupted the baseball game and you know, the World Series game, and said, there's been a major earthquake, you know. Uh, the, the San Francisco Candlestick Park, it used to be it's something else now, 3M or something like that park. It, it it rocked and rolled. It was it was it was scary. Within a year or two, there was another one down here near Los Angeles. See the San Andreas Fault moves on down here, and in that one, not as nearly as major as one in San Francisco, but still pretty bad. 
overpasses collapsed onto, uh, you know, and uh, interstates and things like this. It was pretty bad, and that's even larger population density there. But uh, both of those were pretty bad, both of them along the San Andreas Fault. So it was about, give or take, 80 years between those two major quakes in San Francisco. That's part of the problem because the pressures build up, build up, build up, build up, and when they give, they're really major. It would be far better, probably somewhat unsettling, to have lots of little quakes rather than one big major quake. But you can't, you can put the wishes in, but they don't go anywhere. They're going to happen when they happen. But the uh, notice of San Andreas Fault goes right up the coastline, pretty much. Up here, it's actually between the continent, the uh, North American plate, and the NAS. Uh, what is it? We call that the Juan de Fuca plate. Tiny little plate up here. That forms part of the boundary down here. The specific plate and the uh, North American plate. But that's the problem. It's the stress rock suddenly snaps into a new position. That's what creates the, the quake, the shaking and the quaking. Uh, and that's what causes the damage. Far better to have a series of smaller ones releasing the energy a little bit at a time than having it build up, build up, build up, build up, and then suddenly a major one. That's when you get most of your damage. Now, it doesn't end here. Uh, it's probably not still the San Andreas Fault. It couldn't be. But the same concept of the Pacific Plate, North American Plate, it extends down to South America. Pacific Plate and the South American Plate. And the Andes Mountains are the result of that. Whereas the Sierra Nevadas here, the Cascades up here, they are results of the plate tectonics going on there. Andes in South America, really very active. That's the Nazca plate against the uh, uh, South American plate. There's a lot of that activity, but the Pacific plate also is uh, there too. Now, this is the figure, okay, this is the illustration of what's happening, especially for a transform boundary. That's where they're sliding past each other. Sheer, sheer uh, forces involved there. The uh, force on this plate is going this way, this plate is going that way. It can distort a little bit. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. Now, I never see that big of a, of a thing, but this is, represents the fault line. And when suddenly it goes, I've never seen the width of a road. This is a lot more like it. This is a real picture. That's an illustration. This is a real picture. A farmer's field somewhere, I'm just going to make a guess here. My guess is somewhere down in this area here. That's a rich farming area here. Uh, the uh, San Joaquin Valley is somewhere right in here. I think it's a little further this way. But there's rich, good farming right in here. Somewhere along that fault line, Somewhere along that fault line, this farmer had put his field in, the rows nice and straight, and then after the quake, look how much the rows were uh, displaced. That's probably several inches. I'm guessing six to eight inches displacement. It actually, that's what happens. The earth shifts. It doesn't open. It doesn't crack. It doesn't fall off. It just shifts, okay? And Lauren is here. All right, anyone else slip in where I didn't see you, okay? And that's the real picture. This plate moves that way, that one moves this way. Transform boundary, okay? But that happened suddenly. It didn't happen gradually, it happened suddenly. Very seldom do you see anything like this, you do see it like that. That is the fault line, right there, okay? And like I said, it's not smooth, it's not lubricated, it's not easy, it gives and gives suddenly, okay? 
That's what an earthquake is. Now, how do we locate quakes and also measure the quakes? Okay? Here's a couple of words. They seem to be, they're certainly related, but they're different. The focus of the earthquake is somewhere usually way deep inside the earth. That's the focus of the quake. That's where the quakes actually occur. The actual origin of the seismic waves. That's where whatever it is gave way. That's where the quake erupted. That's where the waves permeate from. Okay? Now, the epicenter, and you always hear them talk about the epicenter of the quake, that is, wherever that is way down deep, goes straight up to the surface, that's the epicenter. The quake, the focus is down there, the epicenter is on the surface of the earth, up directly above the focus. That's where we sense it be, but it really, it was way, way down deep. Now, what a seismograph does, seismic waves, this graphs or plots those waves. It responds to those waves. It's an instrument used to detect and measure earthquakes. Is this globe in your way? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, oh, here's first the picture. Focus somewhere way down here, okay? And this shows a, uh, what kind of fault line is that? Where is the foot wall? Where is the hanging wall? Hanging wall on the wall. Okay. The hanging wall, the foot wall is the part under it. So this is the foot wall. The right is the hanging wall. And when the hanging wall slips down the foot wall, what kind of fault is that? Perfectly normal. No, it's a normal fault. Okay? If it had been pushed up, the hanging wall had been pushed up, this way, that would have been a reverse fault, okay? This was a normal fault. The hang-up was right down there. That's where, and boy, this is exaggerated like crazy, but that's where your, your, your give was. That's where that rock finally gave way, or that ledge, or whatever it was, finally broke, or did whatever it did, elastic rebound, whatever it did, that's where it happened down in the, here. That could have been in the, crust, it could have been way down in the mantle, but somewhere down there, that's the focus. That's the actual center of the focus. The epicenter, though, is the part on the surface directly above that. Notice the fault line's way over here, but the epicenter was right there. Okay? So this, is depending on how steep that angle was, it could be way off from the, where the fault line, where those that shifting occurred that you saw earlier. The focus could have been, let's go back to that. That focus could have been way, way, way back at the end of that field, or maybe this way in that field. It could have been either one. We don't know which way that that uh, the fault line is. But notice, there's no raising or lowering. This is a shift this way, okay? Uh, but wherever it is, it could be angled down so the fault, the focus could have been way, the epicenter could have been way back there or somewhere way here, or it could have been right on the crack. We don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, on this one, you see the epicenter isn't right on the crack, on the fault line. It's above the fault line, way deep. These are, this is what they call the fault plane, whole plane. Okay, so what is a seismograph? Here's what a seismograph basically looks like, okay? The main part is solidly connected to the bedrock of the Earth. I mean, absolutely a part of that, okay? Now, it suspends a weight here. This is a wire here and a movable angle here, okay? And most of the time, it just tracks off. The paper rolls continuously, okay? And most of the time, nothing's happening. You'll see little wiggles or wobbles, but it's just normal seepage, okay? Normal vibrations. But if an earthquake happens, suddenly this pin just goes crazy because this is attached to the earth. 
this is, tries to stay right where it was. The inertia of this heavy weight tries to keep it in place, and the pin goes crazy like that. Now, nothing happened here. This, these are probably the P waves, the primary waves. They're the fastest waves. They get there first. Later, you'll see another set come in. Those are the secondary waves, the transverse waves, the shear waves. And then you'll get the surface waves coming in later, much slower, and they go crazy because they're right on the surface there. So that's basically what your seismograph does. The instrument used to detect and measure earthquakes. Now, I've mentioned this before. I'll say it again. I'll say it later, too. The world usually doesn't get along too well, okay? Not all nations cooperate well with other nations. They just don't play, play well together, okay? But in two areas, every nation on the planet, I believe, is very much in agreement with this, and one of these is, is in the seismographic recording. <clears throat> there are stations in every country on the globe, and these report and share data freely with each other. There's no competition. There's no reason for a competition. And they get along great. And so when, you know, when there's an event happening, everybody you know, records, contributes, shares the information. That's how they're able to figure out where the actually epicenter was, because everyone reports. The other example of nations getting along incredibly well is in uh, tidal waves, tsunamis. They, any nation that borders uh, an ocean, they have detectors out in the oceans measuring unusual changes in the wave patterns, and that lets people know when there's a, seismic, uh, a tsunami coming, a tidal wave, because frankly those are both really dangerous situations. You need to know about them as soon as possible. Those two areas, every country, as far as I know, every country on Earth has been very much in agreement. Okay. So here again we have, as uh, Christy was saying, the types of waves. We covered this in the last chapter. It was even part of this was all the test in the last chapter. The first type of wave is the P wave, the longitudinal wave. Primary wave, that's what P really probably stands for, but you can also think of it as a pressure wave. The longitudinal wave, the, the uh, disturbance is in the same direction as wave propagation, in the same direction. Sound waves are, are P waves, uh, longitudinal waves. Spring waves are that, okay? Uh, those are your uh, longitudinal waves. They are the fastest waves. We'll get to that a little bit later. The S waves, secondary. That's why P are primary, they're the fastest. S waves, secondary, they get there next, second wave. Those are transverse waves. The motion is perpendicular to the propagation, okay? So the motion's up like this, but the wave goes like that, okay? <clears throat> These are transverse waves. Shear waves is another S word you could use there. Um, they do not go through liquids. P waves go through solids and liquids. S waves through solids only, okay? And then finally you get the surface waves. These are the slowest waves. They're the last to happen because the P waves and the S waves come through the Earth. The, S, the surface waves don't occur until they reach the surface, and then they just spread along the surface. Okay? And those are the up and down motion. And this is what caused most of the damage, though, the surface waves. Because the others are underneath the crowd, you know. Uh, they are the reason for the damage, but the surface waves are really what caused. But the seismograph will pick up all three. It picks up the P waves first, the S waves next, and then the surface waves. And the surface waves really make this thing dance. Okay? I think there may be a picture either in your text or in an earlier edition. But these are, yeah. If you look at um, figure 1915, uh, you'll see the description of this. Uh, the A part of this is a drawing 
and it shows the primary waves, which is the pressure wave, highest velocity wave, followed by the S wave, the shear waves, which are the going up and down type waves, and then finally the surface waves, they actually have the P and S waves actually have to reach the surface and then they come across the surface. But if you look at them, the P waves are smaller magnitude, the S waves next biggest, and then the surface waves are huge. Okay? Now, I've mentioned this several times. Gracious. <coughs> All day long. My head is going crazy things. I don't know if it's allergies or what. But it just, I get all clogged up and, uh, and almost dizzy feeling. And then every now and then, sort of mild throbbing headache. Huh? two cheese sticks, one string cheese and one Colby Jack or something like that. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, and a little bit of salt. So we're going to have some meat. No, no, no. What's that? What's that? Yeah, but that is really mild. Yeah, it's actually a monoclonal antibody. It's not a real chemo. You know, that it makes you sick and stuff like that. It's just last weekend I worked like a dog and it was hot and uh, I think that's part of it. I think we need to take a break before we get in the lab and maybe get Yeah, well, I, I'm going down to my office and grab something. I've got a granola bar sitting there waiting for me. Okay. So, the P waves, primary waves, are the fastest. They travel slightly faster than the S waves. Okay? Because of that, they're coming from the same source. Because of that, the difference in their arrival time correlates to how far you are apart. Okay, if you think about this, what if you left here traveling 70 miles an hour at the same time a friend left traveling 60 miles an hour? Okay, so let's say you're going toward Birmingham. Okay, they're going to get to you're going to get to Fairfield just a little bit before they do, right? And then by the time you get to Inslee, you'll be a little more ahead of them. And then by the time you get to Birmingham, you'll be even more ahead of them. Because you're going at 70, they're going at 60. But when it's a pretty short distance, you're not very far ahead. But the longer the distance, the longer the time lag. So the difference in the arrival time between these two rays correlates to the distance from the earthquake. Okay? Now, what they use is triangulation. Have you heard of that before? If you haven't, you've used it whether you realize it or not. And here's an illustration of it. Okay? Well, here's showing the difference in arrival times. Remember that seismograph. It shows when the P wave shows up, and then later the S wave. Surface waves are major, but we don't really care about them. P waves and S waves are coming from directly from the plate. Okay? So, if they come really close together, that means you're close to that plate. If they're further out and there's a longer time between them, then that means your this is your distance from the plate. Okay? So the longer the difference in the arrival time between the P and the S, P always comes first, then the S, that that time difference correlates to how far you are from the plate. Now, that doesn't tell you where the plate is though. It tells you how far you are from the plate. Okay? Now let's say that seismograph A over here, located down here at Z, its difference is down here, and that indicates it's 100 kilometers from that focus. Okay? 100 kilometers. That means the focus could have been anywhere along that 100 kilometer radius. Anywhere. North, south, east, west, no way to tell. But then station Y over here picks it up right in here, indicating it's 150 kilometers away. Well, that meant the earthquake was either down here or up there, but we still don't know. You have to have three. 
triangulation means three, at least three different independent sources. And finally, station X over here, it gets the, the uh, difference here, indicating it's 300 or 200 kilometers away. Now that means it would be either here, here, or here, but to match all three, there it is. And that's the epicenter of the earthquake. The focus is somewhere below that. So that's what we mean by that. Okay, you need to plug in. All right. Now, what else do we use that triangulates? And without it, you don't have a clue. And you probably don't realize. Do any of you use GPS? Yes. Yes, you do. Okay. How does that work? Same deal. The only difference is what it's measuring is signals from at least three different satellites. Now, they don't need to be in line with each other. That wouldn't tell you much. You need three different ones at different locations and they get the signal, they work them out, and then they tell you exactly where you are. Because one satellite would only tell you you're somewhere on here, okay? Another satellite would say you're somewhere here. So you could be there, you could be there. Get the third satellite signal, that pinpoints you, okay? Same thing, triangulation. That works in a lot of things. Frankly, that's almost how um, your deep backs on the football team are going to stop a runner or a receiver. They, 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 they don't run at the person because the person would be moving. So you almost have a triangulation type thing going there. It's not quite the same thing. That tells you exactly where you are and where the earthquake is. All right. So, that's how we locate the earthquakes. How do we measure or classify these? Okay? There's two different things that we do. One is, how deep is the quake? I've already mentioned this. It could be in the crust, it could be way down in the mountain. Okay? So, here's the first way of classifying is based on the depth of that focus where it actually occurred. A shallow focus earthquake is anywhere from the surface, which most of them don't occur really on the surface that much, down to about 70 kilometers. That's about 42 miles deep. That's deep, okay? And that's what we call a shallow focus earthquake. Shallow. Uh, shallow, exactly. And that's, but it could be anything above 70, you know, uh, but that's the crust and into the mountain. And about, yes? Where in the book did you get static pressure? Okay. Um, it seems like it's beginning on page 490, right at the bottom of the page. Are right? Um, actually, before that, um, it's locating and measuring earthquakes. Okay. Uh, Right after they talked about the uh, seismic P waves, S waves, and that kind of stuff, then right after that they talk about the shallow focus, intermediate focus, and deep focus quakes. Okay. Right before 19.3. Okay. Right. Okay. So, 85% of all earthquakes. Okay. This is this. Here's the reason. You think about it up near the crust, in the crust, in the upper part of the mantle, the rocks are brittle. They're hard, they're dry, they're relatively cool. Okay? They're brittle. Okay? So then when something hangs up and breaks, it's going to be pretty major. 85% of all earthquakes are in that upper 70 kilometers or 42 miles. And again, that's the crust and the upper part of the mantle. Now, the intermediate focus earthquakes are much, much deeper. These are 70 to 300 kilometers, which would be about 42 miles to 180 miles deep. Whoa, okay, that is really deep. This is all in the mantle, okay? These are across to the mantle. This is all in the upper part of the mantle, okay? Okay, and then the deep focus earthquakes are 
and evidently they left off something here. Let me correct it. Um, the typesetter here wasn't paying close attention. This should be 300. Let me get my pen. Okay, this should be 350 kilometers deep. Okay, uh, because the next one's 350. Okay. It's in the book correctly on the slides on, but that's just a minor little thing. Okay, this is the upper part of the mountain. Okay, now. The deep focus plates are any below 350 kilometers down to 700 kilometers, which would be 420 miles down. Okay, guess what, folks? You're still in the upper part of the mantle, but you're on the very lower side. What is it that between the upper mantle and lower mantle, there's a sphere in there. What do they call that? Athenosphere. The asthenosphere is that semi-plastic, semi-elastic, hot layer that is, you know, semi-liquid, and that's where your plates set on top of that. The lower part of the mantle is solid. Upper part is broken into those big old plates. Okay? So this goes down basically to the asthenosphere, the lower part of the upper mantle, which is sounds great. About 3% of all earthquakes come from way down there. So here the rock is much hotter, so it's more plastic. So it doesn't give as much. It deforms. It doesn't. But it does occasionally, only about 3%. So how many would be in the middle part? 85% is in the upper part, 3% in the low, deep focus. What would be in the intermediate? About 12%. So about 12% are here. Again, it's, the rock is a little bit hotter, a little more plastic. Okay? Not as brittle. So fewer there and way fewer down here. Okay? But sure enough, they come from all three. So that's one way we classify earthquakes. Where did it originate? originate? How deep was the focus? Shallow, intermediate, or really deep? Okay? Now notice, 70 kilometers there, this covers a range of 280 kilometers here, and yet only 12% are here. And this covers 350 kilometers here, yet only 3% are down there. Deep focus. Okay. Well, another way, and this is the measuring uh, earthquake strength. And by the way, in your text, the figure 1915 is one that shows the seismograph from station A and from station B and shows the time lag between the P and the S waves and see nobody really the surface waves are the biggest but they don't really tell you much because they're traveling on the surface it's the P and S waves those travel through the earth so you can they're more reliable um, and those determine the distances uh, and arrival time tells you how far they are obviously station A no station A was much closer to the plate than station B. Okay. Also on page 491 is example 19.3, which, uh, and this is a reasonable one to think through. Which station is closer to the epicenter if one seismic station in Nevada receives a P wave at 430, 15, 430, 15, that's 430 and 15. 4 hours, 30 minutes, 15 seconds, a.m., and the S wave at 4.30, 35 a.m., while a different seismic station in California receives the P waves at uh, 4.29.59 and the S waves at 4.30.15. Well, there's two reasons you can answer that question. Which station is closer to the epicenter? Well, obviously the one that received the wave first, okay? And that would be station uh, uh, in California, okay? But the other is the difference in time. It was uh, 30 seconds between at, at, uh, in Nevada, and it was only 16 seconds uh, difference. No, 20 seconds at Nevada and 15, uh, 16 seconds difference in California. 
So not a lot of difference, but I mean, those two stations are really close to each other. But obviously the one in California is closer. Okay? And the next question is absolutely, I think, almost silly. At what time does a seismic station receive the S wave if P waves arrive at 11.51.51 a.m.? The S wave arrives 75 seconds later. All you do is add 75 seconds to 51 seconds, which of course you have to carry a minute or two, because uh, 75 and 51 would be 126, and there's 60 seconds in a minute, so that would be two minutes and six seconds later, so that would be. Uh, uh, I don't think they did it right. But anyway, it's about 11.53.06. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. 75 seconds would be a minute and 15 seconds later. So you're just adding 15 seconds to 51. Yeah. Okay. I think I said something wrong. So, how do we measure earthquake strength? This is the uh, next subtopic in this section. Well, the first analysis is usually this. What kind of effects does it have? Uh, how much structural damage to buildings? Does it create fires? Are there landslides? Is the displacement of land surfaces, like you saw in that farmer's field, how much of that is occurring? And if it's occurring in water, what kind of tsunami or tidal wave is produced. This is the obvious measure of the strength of an earthquake. It's not the best measure, okay? Uh, for instance, I mentioned the earthquake in Haiti. That happened, I don't remember what year it was, but it was right, I mean, within a few days of Christmas, right after Christmas. Uh, 2006 or somewhere in there. Very, very, and boy, the damage to buildings was extensive. Major. I mean, hardly, and it, right, it was right in Port au Prince, uh, the capital city. So it's high population density. It was just about the worst of all possible situations. Sorry. Oh, what can? Okay. Um, so, certainly a huge amount of damage. Fires broke out everywhere. I don't know if they had landslides. It seemed like they did. Uh, displacement of land surface, I don't remember. It wasn't over water, so not a, an issue there. That was December, late December. January or February, just within a couple of months, <coughs> There was a major earthquake in Chile, okay? And that had much less damage to buildings, uh, fewer fires, probably had some landslides, displacement of land surfaces, I don't know about it. Again, it wasn't over water, so uh, underwater, so there was no tsunami involved. Which was the more powerful quake? Second. Are you talking about the one between Haiti and Chile? Yeah. You would think it would be Haiti, wouldn't it? Depending on how you measure well, the damage. Exactly. And that's the thing. Haiti had almost zero enforced building codes. Their buildings were just thrown up. Anyone could build a building. They was poorly constructed. They had never had problems with earthquakes. They didn't even worry about it. Chile, though, right on that uh, fault line, and they were always bothered by earthquakes. Their building codes were some of the toughest in the world, so their buildings sustained it better. The one in Chile was several times more powerful than the one in Haiti, but the damage in Haiti was way worse. So the Mercalli scale, this was several years ago, uh, decades ago, it does on relative intensity. It's what you feel. 
It wasn't felt that was the number one, okay? You may have detected it was seismograph that you didn't feel. Up to 12, which is total destruction with visible ground waves. I mean, you saw it happen, okay? You saw and felt the earth just really shake. You didn't feel a thing here. So that was 1 to 12, okay? But again, it depended on the destruction. Now, actually, one of the worst earthquakes ever recorded was in Alaska, okay? But nobody was living anywhere near it. So there weren't very many buildings destroyed. There were hardly any fires. I mean, you don't get forest fires. It's only broken power, uh, you know, power lines and, and gas lines that cause fires, mostly. Uh, landslides, it may have had some. Displacement on land surfaces may have had some, but no one could see it. That was way out in the boonies. However, it did form a two tsunami. It was close enough to the uh, Pacific that Hawaii was swamped by its tsunami. Here's Alaska here, and I believe it was somewhere along in here was where the uh, earthquake happened in the Hawaiian Islands. That far away, thousands of miles away, the, the northeast part of their coast was just wiped. But again, that was before they were very well populated either. It was around the 1900s, or I don't know, somewhere around in there. Okay, so Macaulay scale, relative intensity. Not the most accurate of scales. Okay? Now, here's a slide, and we're going to see it later, so I'm not going to go into a great deal of, of detail here. This is hard for you to read. It's in your book. Uh, we're going to see the same stuff just a little bit. So don't sweat this for now. Okay? Like I said, we're going to see the same thing. If this doesn't show up in the slide, we'll come back to that. Okay? Well, along came a guy named Charles Richter. I think he was out of uh, Caltech, I believe. Somewhere out in California. Earthquake capital of the U.S., you might say. And they, he decided to do something that was based, based on the swings in the seismograph recording. Okay? So his was not based on how much you felt of it. That wasn't very accurate. It was how much the seismographs fell all over the world, okay? And they actually make this a logarithmic scale. I don't know, are y'all familiar with logarithms? Probably not, okay? In a log scale, a 10 may be a 1, okay? A 100 would be a 2. A 1,000 would be a 3. You base on basically how many zeros there are after the number. So it takes a really big range and compresses it into something much more useful. Uh, several things use log scales. Uh, have you ever heard of pH? That measures acidity or basicity of something, blood or soil or anything like that. That's a log scale. What you're measuring is the pH is the percentage of hydrogen ions that are in solution. And hydrogen ions measure acidity. And it's sort of the reverse scale. Uh, the higher the number of items, you, you flip it, and that's the lower the pH. That's a log scale. Because you're talking about tens of thousands of, of, uh, of fractional um, uh, ions in solution. So it's, it takes big numbers and helps make them more manageable. Another log scale is decibels. Have you ever heard of that? You know, what you hear. I don't know if you can hear me, but maybe you can barely hear. From that to an airplane taking off, your ears can hear all that. The energy between those two are several orders of magnitude. This would be like 0.3, that would be 4 billion, or not, maybe not that much. It's just enormous difference. Well, log scale gets it down to something more magical, okay? Takes really big numbers and, and gets it to and on the Richter scale, a 3 is not felt, okay? And the 9 is the largest measured so far. That's the one in the left, I believe. 
I think there may be been one since then that was a nine. The one in Chile, I think, was about seven or so, and the one in uh, Haiti was in the six range. So basically, the one, because every number you go up on a log scale is ten times as powerful. So the one in Chile was ten times more powerful than the one in, in, in uh, Haiti on average. And, uh, and yet the one in Haiti did so much more damage because of the poor building codes there. Okay? Now, here is the Richter magnitude. Zero to two, you measure on a seismograph, but you won't ever feel at all. The smallest detectable earthquakes only on the seismograph. Okay? The two to three are detected and measured, but not generally felt. You still aren't going to feel them. You can detect and measure. It's hard to measure these because only the closest seismograph is going to record anything and you, got, you can't triangulate, okay? So it's really hard to measure. Uh, these you can triangulate, you can detect it and measure it, but you usually still don't feel it. Three to four, though, you feel as a small earthquake, but no damage occurs. Now, we keep talking as if San Francisco and Los Angeles and the West Coast and, and where the plates are, that's where the earthquakes are. And they are. They are there. But guess what? They have earthquakes in Oklahoma. They had one just in the last decade in Washington, D.C. or somewhere in Virginia. Okay? Now, we didn't feel it here at all. But the Washington Monument, the tall obelisk, this in Washington, D.C., in crack. And they had to keep that closed for several years while they inspected and made sure that it was safe for people to go. Because people used to be able to climb the stairs, there may be that elevator, I don't remember, and go to the top and see all of Washington, D.C. from that. But they couldn't go up there anymore until they determined how much the damage was and whether it was safe for people to go up. That would probably have been. Uh, maybe a four to five, okay? But, I was mentioning to you the farm over in Georgia. Uh, we had just built our house there, that's why I'm over less than a decade. And the next Christmas, Karen's sister gave her uh, a little metal hanging that just said farm. It was cute, but you know, so we thought, well, where are we going to put it? So we hung it up over there. The next time we visited, it was on the floor. So we put down our farm site. You know, had it hanging there. The book was still up there. And we said something to my sister-in-law, on my side of the family, who lives on the farm. She said, oh, that was probably the earthquake. So they did feel it down in Georgia, but just barely. But it shook just enough that they knew it was happening. Epicenter was up in Virginia somewhere. Washington, D.C. felt it big time that it cracked the Washington Monument, but they still felt it in Georgia. Uh, that would have been felt as a small earthquake with no damage occurred. It knocked the sign off the wall, so that's all. Okay? Minor earthquake with local damage, that would have been in D.C. Moderate earthquake with structural damage. Now, I'm trying to think what the ones are in Oklahoma. Here's the deal, folks. Most of the time we think of earthquakes as being naturally occurring, right? That's just Mother Nature doing her thing. Sometimes man influences that. I was going to say this earlier. On those seismographs, all these countries agreeing and, you know, what a benefit that's come out of that they are also sensitive enough they detect nuclear blasts. So when a country is trying to hide that they're developing nuclear weapons, everybody in the world finds out really quickly because the seismograph system that's all over the world, they detect something and they say, where's this earthquake? What's there an earthquake doing there? Ah, that wasn't an earthquake. That was they were testing the nuclear weapon. Now a regular bomb doesn't count on a nuclear bomb. They 
Well, I'm not. Well, no sort of harm be on that. On the about four, it would probably five. be, depending on how close you were to it, probably this, if, if even that. But it definitely detected. Okay? So most of them, especially if they're trying to keep it very quiet and do a small one, it's oh, down here, but they still detect and measure and can pinpoint exactly where it was. And they said, that didn't seem like an earthquake to us, you know, and we uh, found out, nope. Pakistan tested a nuclear weapon, they weren't supposed to, or something like that. Okay. Now, somebody did do that later. What's that? Somebody did do that later. Yeah, uh, uh, North Korea was probably, probably the last one. Uh, and they claimed they tested a hydrogen bomb, but it was not detected very much in hydrogen bombs. Make a lot of detection. So uh, we sort of doubt they really did a hydrogen bomb. Yeah, they just, they haven't. No one's developed one that was that small before, so, okay. Now, strong earthquake with destruction, that probably was Haiti in here, whereas the one major earthquake with extensive damage, that would have been Chile, but because Chile's building codes were so good, they didn't have that much damage. But, <laughs> if you get in the up eight, nine range, ain't nothing you can do to keep that from being uh, I mean, you can minimize, but you still going to be total destruction. Now, one of the largest earthquakes probably that we sense have happened, but we were not here to sense it ourselves, there was an earthquake somewhere in the middle part of the U.S., okay? Uh, I believe it's Madrid, it's spelled like Madrid, but it's called Madrid, Missouri, I believe it is, somewhere there. There was such a major earthquake, not near any plate boundaries or anything, uh, such a major earthquake that they reported the Mississippi River flowed upstream for like a day and a half, and then started coming back down the river. That had to have been a major, major, major earthquake. Yeah. You said you heard about that? Another fault line? Yeah. The St. Maria fault line? Yeah. Okay. And we're, we're going to hit that in a little bit too. Okay. So, these are the majors. That one in Nebraska, a nine. And it seems like there's been at least one or two others that have been nines. Uh, all right. Now, remember back when I said, don't worry about this because you're going to see it again? Here it is. Okay. Earthquake safety. This is much easier to read. That's why I said don't worry about it back there. During the shaking, now this is so easy to say. Don't panic, okay? <laughs> Goodness gracious, if I started shaking around, I'm not sure I could say, oh, don't panic, you know. That's going to be the first thing you'll think of. If it, it says if you're indoors, stay there. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. If you're in a really safe building, I would say stay there. It says stay away from glass. Do not use any other flames, okay? Any flames, because you don't know if maybe a, power, a gas line has been breached somewhere that you didn't know was there. If you're outside, move away from buildings, okay? So if you're inside, you stay in one. Now get away from buildings. Stay in the open, okay? safe place to be. If you're in a car, bring it to a stop as soon as possible, but stay in the car. The car suspension system will ease the waking for you, but don't keep moving. Unless you happen to be under an overpass. Get out from under the overpass, okay? Not a good place to be, okay? Now, after the shake, it says check, but do not turn on utilities, again, because you may have uh, gas leaks, and if you turn on something that's going to create an arc or a spark, you can ignite a pretty major blaze. If you still have power, turn on your radio or TV. And this is why those, my wife ordered for us somewhere, I think they're at the lake, uh, these wind-up radios that you can actually work even if you don't have power, okay? Uh, Sort of like the old grinders on the phone. What's that? Yeah. So, 
uh, and, and those are good things to have. TVs, you don't have them like that, only radio. But if you got power, turn on the radio and TV. Stay off the telephone, even your cell phones, unless you're going to report something that needs to be reported. Like you see somebody in danger, you see somebody trapped in a car in a building, uh, you know, in a fire breaking out. Yeah, get on the phone then, but don't get on, hey, you know, how's it in your place, you know? You don't want to do that, okay? Because the lines will get, number one, many of the lines will go down. The actual lines will go down, you know? So the very little thing, and towers will go down, and other things will go down, and then you have very little thing, and if everybody's just chatting away on there, emergency communications can't get off. Okay, but if you're down, then everything's falling on top of you. Yeah, so that's why go up. Well, well I, no, I that's where I say get out. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that's what I would suggest is get out. But they say here, don't. Uh, but if there's a damaged building, don't go checking it out. Okay, because that thing's can. Uh, and here's one of the main reasons there. It's why any time there's an earthquake, there's going to be what we call aftershocks. So if something has been weakened, loosened, seems like it's okay, but then an aftershock hits, even though it's much weaker than the original, things will fall apart. So that's why get out is my suggestion. Don't go sightseeing, okay? We've had at least two major tornadic issues since I've been teaching here. Uh, one was the one that hit um, Oak Grove. Pleasant Grove. Ple no, no, before that, Oak Grove. Uh, this was uh, probably 15 years ago. Oak Grove. Yeah, and I think it destroyed their high school, you know, and stuff. Uh, uh, and that wasn't as bad as the next one that was the one that Pleasant Grove and, and just Tuscaloosa, I mean, uh, goodness, all up and down the state of Alabama. Major, major damage. Okay? One of the worst things to happen because of that, people get in the car and go say, hey, I heard it was really bad at uh, Pleasant Grove. You got to start driving around in emergency vehicles. The roads are already, you know, you know, messed up, trees and everything else. And now people are clogging the roads, emergency vehicles can't get through. So don't go sightseeing for that very reason. Uh, just stay somewhere safe uh, and try to just hang out. So it's a lot of the same type of things you would do for a tornado or anything else. Okay. Now, how are we doing on time? No, but. 2.30, started at 12, two and a half hours, two hours would be 4.30. Yep, doesn't look like we're going to get to do the lab today, does it? Yeah. Want to take a break? This sounds like a good time. Origin of Mountains is starting 19.04, so uh, uh, one thing before we go. On that Richter scale, remember we said one unit on the Richter scale represents 10 times the, and here's, it is in your text, I want you to see it. Uh, an increase of one on the Richter scale means that the amount of movement of the ground is increased by a factor of 10. The amount of energy released by a factor of 30. Okay, so a big time difference. So if that one in Chile was a seven something and the one in Haiti was a six something, easily could have been 10 times more movement in Chile, but less damage, 30 times more energy, okay? Now, I'm not sure they were a full one apart, but still, it's there. So yeah, let's take a break now. Uh, actually, want to do one more thing, sorry. Compare the energy released by an earthquake of 7.2 magnitude to an earthquake with a 5.2. That's a difference of two units. That would be 100 times the movement, 300 times the energy. So that's, wanted to get that down before we did. Okay. Now let's go. <laughs> okay. And pause here.
Now, 19.4, uh, I did right before we left, uh, example 19.5, then I saw 19.6. Uh, compare the amount of movement of the ground surface wave amplitude associated with two earthquakes in example 19.2. Uh, 19.2 19 was the energy difference. That was a difference of uh, 30 times 30 is 900. I think I said that wrong before. I said 300. Uh, the uh, movement of the ground, that was your 100 times. 10 times 10 is 100. I uh, said so that backwards. I'm not backwards, but a little bit wrong on the energy difference. Now, and again, before we get there, let me go back one more. Uh, actually, two more. Three more? Okay, I know it was on here somewhere. Oh, there it was. Okay. Tsunami. Okay. There's words here. Does that sound like any particular language to you? Japanese, Japanese for sure. That Japanese, uh, what we call a tidal wave, they call a tsunami. Okay. Um, and actually, our name, tidal wave, it has nothing to do with the tides. Okay. Tidal wave would be just a wave that happened because of tides. This is a wave that happens because of an earthquake, okay? Um, and just to remind you, I mentioned the one back that hit Alaska, the earthquake in Alaska that caused a tidal wave that did major damage in Hawaii, thousands of miles away, okay? Uh, more recently, and this again, it seemed like may have been around Christmas one year, uh, was a... <coughs> earthquake that occurred in uh, Indonesia, off the coast of Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is an island country, basically. This is all part of Indonesia, all these islands down here. Okay, some of these are Malaysia, some of them are other countries, but this big part down here is Indonesia. A it was either Indonesia or it was uh, up here in Thailand. I don't remember which it was. Uh, seemed like it was Indonesia. They had a major earthquake hit there. The tidal wave made its way across the Indian Ocean, the entire Indian Ocean, and hit Madras. It was the name of the city. It's now called Chennai. Uh, and the beaches there and killed quite a few people. The wave came in, I um, can't remember how tall it was, um, but even a three or four foot high, I think it was higher than that, tidal wave coming in like that, it goes quite a ways in and it can, can you know, wash people with cars and boats and all sorts of things away. Uh, and there was major damage in uh, Sri Lanka and in southern India because of tidal wave off the coast of Indonesia. Now, there in Indonesia, I think the tidal wave also went up and really wiped out parts of Thailand. I think that's how Thailand would get the picture. Uh, like here is part of Thailand down there. That got it pretty bad. But actually, that tidal wave built as it went across the Indian Ocean. And that was just oh, so the tidal wave came from Indonesia? Yeah, it came from Indonesia. Oh. Up of the tidal wave hit Indonesia. Actually, it, it, it went back and hit Indonesia. Okay. I mean, not went back. It hit Indonesia first, but then it came across oh, and hit okay, Indonesia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, it, yeah, it was going both through all directions from the ocean. Yeah. Now, also, you probably remember this one major earthquake. And I don't remember the name of the town somewhere way up north in Japan. Earthquake just off the uh, coast of Japan, and it had a big tidal wave. It didn't go out this far and do much damage, but they came back toward them. 
and wiped out the nuclear power plant at Fukushima. And that nuclear power plant then it wiped out all the everything, their safety, the backup systems, everything, and they had a major, major meltdown. But they had everything fairly well contained, and uh, but still, there's a lot of worry about people who lived in that area, still living in that area, uh, how much residual damage there may be to health and other things. So yeah, the tidal waves are true. Can be tsunamis. That's the better word for it. The tsunamis. Okay. I didn't feel like I put enough emphasis on that last time. All right. So now we're ready for origin of mountains. Nineteen point four. Now, <clears throat> what is a mountain? Definition given here: an elevated part of the Earth's crust rising abruptly above the surrounding surface, okay? And when we say tallest mountain in the world, what do we usually say? Mount Everest in Nepal, okay? That's the northern part of India. It's up here in the Himalayas. Uh, Nepal is this little, I'm pretty sure it's up here, the brown country there. No, no, it's this country here. Yeah, this is a little light colored country there. That's Bhutan over there, I believe it is. Uh, yeah, Bhutan is set up this Nepal. And it's right in Nepal. Uh, but guess what? By this definition, see, it's in the Himalayas. The entire chain of the Himalayas, which is a huge chain here, that entire chain is elevated. And Mount Everest is tall. I mean, I guarantee it's tall. Its peak is the highest above sea level of any mountain in the world. But for abrupt change, I think Mount Kilimanjaro in uh, uh, Kenya and Tanzania, uh, right in there, Mount Kilimanjaro, right down here. I can't find it. I think that may be up there, but I can't see it. There it is. There it is. Not going to draw it. Right, maybe more inside Tanzania than, than, than Kenya. But that's the most abrupt mountain in the world because all around it is a really flat plain. And then it just way peaks up. Not nearly as tall above sea level as Mount Everest is, but the, above the surrounding areas is much taller. Okay? So that abruptly above the surrounding surface area, surface area. Now, don't get me wrong. Everest is way up there too, because even above the elevated part of the thing, it sticks way, way up there. Now, these mountains are caused by either the folding. Remember that. That's the plastic strain, or by the faulting. Okay. That's the brokenness. That's the uh, uh, fractured strain. Okay, either by folding or faulting of the crust. <clears throat> and again, three basic origins, folding, faulting, but then here's a third one, volcanic activity. Okay, now volcanic activity would be like for, and these are just a few of the examples, the Cascade Mountains here along the coast of Northwest Coast, uh, Individual peaks. Mount Rainier near Seattle is one. Mount Hood, I think, is fairly close to, to, to Portland, visible from Portland. Uh, Mount Shasta in Northern California. All those are volcanic mountains, again, because they're fairly close to the plate boundaries here. The Sierra Nevada Mountains down here, I don't think they're nearly as many volcanic. They're probably faulted or folded mountains, probably faulted. Okay, so volcanic activity. Well, certainly, Kilauea has been in the news a lot lately, and that's not much of a mountain at all. Okay, it's really low, but it's been erupting like crazy. So let's look at those three separately, uh, at least 
folded and faulted together and then volcanic. So folded and faulted mountains. There are a couple of these type. One is the dome mountains. They have begin as a big, broad, remember the arch? What was the arch called? Started with A. Anticline. Remember that one? And then the trough was the syncline. Okay, syncline. S Y N C O N. Okay? Well, we're talking about the arching fold that was the Dome Mountains. Ever been to Stone Mountain in Georgia? Okay. Definitely a Dome Mountain. Okay, it just sticks up there, you know, out of nowhere, it seems like. It's just a huge, uh, it's not that big of a mountain, but yeah, prior arching fold. Now, these folded or faulted mountains, they're overlying sedimentary rocks. They weather away, leaving more resistant granite peaks. That's usually what you see, the granite peaks, because the other stuff has weathered away. The sedimentary rocks are usually much softer and less uh, resilient than the uh, resistant granite rocks would be. So a lot of times you see peaks like that. Now, let me mention the folded mountain. Let's see. It may actually have a picture. Let me see. Now, this is just the illustration. This is the dome that's happening here. <clears throat> and you see there's a lot of layering going on. Now, the top layer could actually be soil. It's not rock, okay? Plant material stuff in it. it the stuff is coming up from underneath. There certainly looks like there could be some sedimentary rocks in layers here, but somewhere under there is probably some igneous rock, granite, coming up. And that may be what's pushing everything up. Well, if you picture this, that surface is being stretched because it's being pushed up from below, and it's easily erodible away, especially if it's soil. And that usually does disappear in time. And then the softer sedimentary rock, you know, that's also being stretched, and that, you know, if not much compaction or cementation, it's going to be weathered away. And then what's left is the granite underneath that's been pushed up there. It's not going to go away as fast. And they do show, I believe, in the book somewhere, or maybe it was an earlier edition. Um, and I don't see it. Uh, maybe it was another chapter. Um, oh, it was in Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid. Uh, I, I can't think. Actually, there is a mountain called Sundance Mountain, but there was a place uh, that was pretty much one of these type. Okay, It's not in the current book. It was an earlier edition. Or in another chapter. We'll see. Maybe it'll be next chapter. Okay. That was kind of the folded part. Okay? The fold. Now, your picture in your book uh, on page 493, figure 1917, the folded structure of the Appalachian Mountains revealed by weathering and erosion obvious from the Skylab photograph. This is near the Tennessee, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky border area. Uh, and they showed clouds in the Blue Ridge Mountains. But you can almost tell the foldedness there. And frankly, I'm not sure this is true here, but if you think about Shades Mountain and uh, Red Mountain, they're sort of a line of mountains, not just one individual mountain. It's a it's a whole stretch of mountains. To me, that's got to be almost a fold. It could be a fault, but I think it's more of a fold. And the Appalachians are folded. And guess what? The Appalachians are some of the oldest mountains in the world. The Rockies, the Himalayas, much newer than the Appalachians. Because Appalachians, they've been there a long time. They're weathering down. The others are just being formed. They're actually growing. At one time, Appalachians were probably way taller 
that whatever the Rockies are, the Andes are, the uh, Himalayans are now, but they've weathered away to much smaller. So let's go to fault block mountains. <clears throat> what characterizes them, they rise sharply along steeply inclined fault, fault plains. And if you've ever driven west into the Rockies, they just pop up, okay? Not a folded thing like gradual increase like you see in the Appalachians, but they just pop up there. In fact, if you're driving west, you'll see them for miles. You think, okay, we're almost there. Next day, we're almost there. <laughs> you know, they are way, way out there because they just pop up so sharply along those steeply inclined fault lines. Now, the weathering does erode away the sharp edges so basically, the sharper the edges, the nearer the mountains. The more rounded they are, the longer they've been there. And the Appalachians, very rounded. Very, very rounded. Okay? And this illustration shows that a little bit. And remember when they talked about the graven and the horse? Okay? Uh, I can't even remember now which is which. One of these is a horse and one's a graven, you know. But whatever, they popped up there because of, and this looks like tensional stresses that pulled them apart. The, the hanging wall slid down. The, the, this, is, this is the foot wall here, foot wall here, foot wall here, hanging wall, hanging wall, hanging wall, hanging wall. So they, the hanging walls have slid down the foot walls. They started off pretty sharp and, and jagged, but over time, erosion has worn off the edges. And filled in the valleys, okay? The sediments that wore off the top did this, so now the mountains don't seem as tall. Number one, they're not as tall, but then the bases grown because of their decline, okay? So that's what happens with faulting. Now, those look pretty rounded too, but they're still fault block mountains. They're just a little bit older. Now let's get into the volcanic mountains, the third class. Okay, what is a volcano? It's a hill or a mountain formed by the extrusions of lava or rock fragments from the magma below. Okay, magma is the melted material that's below the surface. It generally is originating maybe in the asthenosphere, very seldom I think from the core. Certainly it's melted down there, but that's way too deep. It's usually from the asthenosphere, which is sort of a semi-liquid type area, but more likely where you have the activity going on, the subductive crust bumping against the higher crust, and the heat that's generated there melts it, and here it comes. Or opens fissures that it comes up from further below. Okay? But it's all coming from magma below once it breaks through the surface, that magma becomes lava. But it's not just that. These are also made out of rock fragments. Okay? Do you remember Mount St. Helens? There's some pictures in the book. I think we may see some on the slides there. Mount St. Helens was a uh, volcanic mountain in Oregon. Western Oregon. Uh, Eastern Oregon, I think. And When it blew up, it blew part of the side of the mountain off, okay? So not all of that was lava that came rolling down. That was rock fragments that were basically had plugged the volcano to begin with or the side of the mountain. It was all sorts of stuff, okay? When my wife and I were over in Italy between spring and summer term, we took a niece and a nephew over there. Uh, nephew of the niece met us there. Uh, we went and visited Pompeii. We had never done that before. And Pompeii was basically covered with ash, not with, with lava. Okay? If it had been covered with lava, a lot of the stuff that's there would have burned to a crisp. Okay? Because that was molten rock. It was covered with debris that blew out of Mount Vesuvius and covered the whole city, and therefore it was preserved. They just have to dig through and find the stuff that was underneath. 
those places that were hit with the lava flow, all the structures were burned. I mean, and because that's hot stuff, and, and bodies would have been burned to a crit. I mean, they found you know, uh, a lot more stuff there because it hadn't been burned. So it's not just the lava, it's also the rock, rock fragments. Now, the structure, and they do a really poor job of describing this, you have vents, which are the actual openings through which lava comes, the crater, which is left from previous eruptions, and then, of course, the lava flow, either current or previous. And you'll see that on some of these things. This, I believe, is Mount St. Helens. Okay? I'm pretty certain that is. Yeah. This is uh, the top of Mount St. Helens. Is in your book, this is figure 1920. Uh, this is the top of Mount St. Helens several years after the 1980 explosion. Were any of you alive in 1980? No, most of you not. A few of you were. Okay. Uh, huh? Yeah. And a uh, guy said he was. I was. Okay. I was 30 years old. <laughs> so. Uh, now, let's take a look. You can't see the vent here. It's covered with the, uh, and this is after it has erupted, but it's still sending out steam and other things. So, but it's not erupting right now. It's just still steam and other gases coming out. The vent is somewhere down in there. There could be vents cracked along the side here, but most of these are in that crater. The crater is the area here. Now, I think I mentioned before, this side of the mountain, I believe it was, blew off. Okay and it's probably downhill somewhere here. But you can see then the lava flows. These are well hardened by now, but you can see where lava flowed. Now these aren't all from the recent eruptions. Some of these could have been from previous eruptions, hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Okay? So there's our most famous in the continental U.S. Uh, in recent years with Mount St. Helens. Not one of the bigger ones, by the way, either. Okay. Is this What's that? Is, is this still active? <laughs> Not for a while. Uh, I bet you it probably is still sending out some steam every now and then. Uh, but as far as actively erupting, no. Uh, not in the terms that Kilauea is. Okay. Now. There are several other pictures in the text. Um, let me back off on one. On page 494, the 1918, the Teton Mountains of Wyoming are fault rock mountains. Notice how jagged they are. This is on page 494, the Tetons. We've been there a few times. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful mountains. Okay? Now, uh, on 495 is Mount Aloha in Hawaii. I imagine that's also on the Big Island. I'm not sure, but that's a lot how Kilauea used to look, uh, except Kilauea has been spewing forth or leaking forth uh, lava almost continuously for decades, but now recently is really spewing it out. Okay, And you'll see that there are sometimes different vents Sometimes near the top, sometimes near the edges. Uh, okay. So let's now look at the types of volcanics. Okay, remember a volcanic mountain is formed by either rock fragments or the lava that's made to the surface. Of these, there's three kinds. The shield volcanic well, They're integrated between the two, three, two. But let's start with just the pure ones. Shield volcanics constructed of solidified lava flows, generally broad, gently sloping uh, cones. When you saw the picture of Mauna Loa, that's what you got. Kilauea, that's what you got. They're, they're more like mounds than they are mountains, okay? Just gently sloping cones. Then there's a cinder cone volcano. Now this is made almost completely of, of, of lava, okay? The shield volcano. The cinder cone 
It's constructed of a rock fragments. That's where the cinder comes in. These are called the cinders. They're steeper uh, but smaller than the shield volcanoes. Okay? Steeper this way, but generally smaller around. Okay? And there's a good picture in your book. The earlier editions did not have a good illustration of a cinder cone volcano, but um, your this new edition does on, fig, on page 496. Uh, this is a sunset crater, a cinder cone volcano near Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay? And you see nice perfectly shaped little uh, cone, really steep, whereas the shield volcanoes are very, very broad, gently sloping. This is quite steep, okay? And then the third kind is the composite volcano. Alternating layers of cinders, but also ash, lava flows, with volcanic mud. So you just have all sorts of things there. These are usually your massive, gorgeous, huge volcanoes like Mount St. Helens, like Shasta, like Mount Rainier, Fu uh, Fuji in Japan. Uh, these are the big, just beautiful looking uh, uh, volcanoes, much larger than any of either of the other two. Okay? Let's see if they got a picture of them. All right, here's Mauna Loa. This is the one we, I pointed out in the book. That's a shield volcano. Gently rounded slope, almost all lava flow. They're, usually the eruptions aren't serious. You can tell there was a crater here, a crater there, a little bitty vent here, one here, one there. You know, it just wherever they seem to pop up and, and they'll just ooze out lava and just make this gentle <coughs> sloping, more like a mound than the mountain. Okay, just like that. So that's your shield. Here is your composite. Like I said, the slideshow doesn't show any cinder cone, but your book finally has a picture of the cinder cone. So here's your composite volcano. Huge, tall, steep. Usually the crater is fairly small. Here's the crater here, there it is there, possibly a secondary one here. I can't tell, it may be just the light there. That's definitely, I think, the crater there. It looks like there may have been one over here, you know, kind of like those shield volcanoes you saw in different places where it's been. But this is the major. And that is that composite. It's just a bit. You can see lava flows way over here from some very, very ancient eruption. But this can be made out of cinders, which are rock fragments, it can be made out of lava flows. It can be made out of uh, ash deposits and what they call volcanic mud. Just all, composite, just about anything that can come out there. And like you see, here's what I was pointing out. Here's the main crater up there, but you have smaller vents, say here, and here maybe, possibly over here, where they came out sometime in the past. Okay? So there's your composite volcanoes. These are the magnificent, beautiful, to look at volcanoes. You hope they don't erupt again. They have erupted in the past, and who knows? No one suspected that Mount St. Helens was going to blow, but she did. And same thing could happen for Rainier. Boy, Seattle would be in pretty serious danger, though it's, it's quite a distance away. Fuji in, in uh, Japan has a lot of population density not far from Tokyo. Uh, that would be really effective if that ever blew. So yeah, we've got population way too up. But at one time, Pompeii was an active little town, okay? Uh, in fact, maybe a city. And when Vesuvius blew, it got wiped completely out. They didn't even, after a while, people didn't even remember it was there. And when they started digging around, I don't know, a farmer there was some story about a farmer was doing something in his field and ran across something and said, what in the world is this? He called in the experts and they found the city underneath them. <laughs> you know, so it's just pretty incredible. Okay. Now, what are some other features of the Earth's surface? 
the building of the Earth's surface. That's what this chapter is. A lot of magma never makes it to the surface to become lava. It pushes, you know, and moves things around, but never makes it to the surface. Most magma remains underground. It cools and solidifies to form intrusive rock as opposed to extrusive igneous rock. Okay? If it's cooling magma, it's got to be igneous. That's what that's the definition. So many of these things happen there. And here are a few of the processes and the results of these processes. The first of these is the batholith. Okay? Now when you see lith, think rock. Okay? Uh, the goodness, what was that word we used? Uh, the rock forming process. I can't think of it right now. But back when we were talking about sedimentary rocks, cementation and, and, and uh, compaction, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it had lith all over it. So here's some examples of batholith. That's where the magma down here, way deep, has pushed its way up and maybe never quite broke the surface, but forced up the sedimentary rock that was on the surface and bent it upward, okay? This is folding, you might say. Bent it upward and created what they call a hogback, a very rough, rigid thing made from the edges of this. Well, there's a hogback. Where is that? Here we go. Batholith intrusions can cause hogback. These are rough areas here that are really made from the edges of the sedimentary layers. Okay? So the batholith is that big structure underneath that causes all this, but you may never see. Now, it looks like here there may be some that are visible that made it. Probably didn't solidify on the surface, but they pushed the way up and the surface has eroded away, left them static. Okay? So that created the hogbacks. Okay? By basically, the batholiths are a large amount of crystallized magma that crystallized underneath and then probably later got exposed. The stock. The stock is in the batholith, but a protrusion, so they found a weakness here in this uh, sedimentary rock and pushed its way up and made a little intrusion there, okay? That's the stock, a small protrusion from a batholith, okay? Now, other processes, a dike, okay? Here's an example of that. It's a vertical or near vertical founding. Now, this was a big break or push up, the stock is, through layers of bedrock or sedimentary rock. Here is a small fracture in there. And the dikes are the vertical or near vertical protrusions that make their way up. And then they produce sometimes silts. If there's a weakness between the layers, and you get horizontal uh, filling in there, those are called silts. Vertical or dikes, horizontal or silts. They're very small protrusions up cracks or fissures or, or any weakness area they can find. The stock would be a much larger weak area, okay? Then you have what they call litholiths, okay? That would be a dike coming up from way below getting near the surface and the left lift then where the surface layers are lighter and easier to move then the the uh, uh, magma forces its way up and you form a left lift. That's a large protrusion not too far below the surface of the uh, soil that's pushed its way up. That would be under there is a left lift. Under there probably. Under there. This dike has made its way up here, and it's almost made of something like a hog factory on a much smaller scale. Okay? So that's some of these processes. These are the other features that you see caused by magma, but never making it to the surface. So it doesn't become lava, 
doesn't produce a volcano, but it, it solidifies underneath. Okay? So what's the overall picture here? Okay? This is for mountains. Okay, remember there's three types. Folded, faulted, and volcanic. So mountain ranges are many times composites of many different processes. Each of them uniquely structured. There could be folded mountains right next to fault mountains. Nearby volcanic mountains. Okay? So you have all these going on and integrated between the two. Some places they're folded, but then other just right nearby faulted. Okay, in other words, rather than bending, they actually broke. Okay, volcanic activity. I wouldn't be at all surprised that near Mount Shasta, which is a volcano, you have some folded or faulted mountains right alongside. Okay, this is especially apparent along the converging plate boundaries. Some of the converging plate boundaries, the obvious ones, are the number of the India Australia plate, where it's converging with the Eurasian plate, there's your uh, Himalayan mountains. Probably mostly fault block mountains, very jagged, but also volcanic activity here, especially the end over toward China. They've had volcanoes and major, major earthquakes in the mountains that's just off the Himalayas over there in China. You feel this, there's some major, major mountains in here. Here are the Himalayas, they're the biggest, but they make a big arc here where those two plates have collided, divergent plates. Okay? Let's see if we got another figure here. Yeah. Here's the example. Here's that little bitty plate of Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and a little bit of. British Columbia, Vancouver Island. Okay? Is there a picture of that quote? I think so. Um, page 498. Okay. Got it? Okay. And this is a converging boundary. The one to do the plate is being pushed by the Pacific plate into the North American plate. Now, down here, this is more San Andreas Fault down here. There's San Francisco, and it goes up like this. It forms part of this boundary here, okay? But much of it is a transform boundary, not a converging boundary, okay? It's the one, the Fuca plate, is, is the converging. So what's happened? This is being subducted under the continental plate because the continental plate, of course, is lighter density. Then it brought the one, the Fuca plate, to be higher density basaltic rock is undergoing here as that goes underneath this plate and runs into a lot of resistance there then you have volcanic activity all up and down if you look at there Mount Garibaldi I bet you that's volcanic I don't know that myself Mount Baker I know is um, can't read that one something with heat Glacier Peak uh, Mount Rainier, I know that is. Mount Adams, I'm pretty sure that is. Mount St. Helens, I know that one is. Mount Hood, I know that one is. Mount Johnson, I don't Service. know about that. I bet you it is. Three Sisters must be three in a row. Crater Lake, that makes a crater. That is a the crater of, a, of an extinct volcano. Okay, Mount Shasta, I know that is. Uh, I don't know about what's on Peak. I'm guessing that is too. But you see this activity here, the one to fuca plate converging with the North American plate, plant subducting under it, creates all this activity along here, volcanic activity, but also does some folding and some faulting. Okay? I'm wondering myself whether San Andreas Fault does or something like it doesn't run through here, and that's the reason you have Vancouver Island separated from the rest of British Columbia. Uh, Vancouver, the city is over here, this is Vancouver Island here, uh, I think it's the main city that's on this, seems like it's another B word, but I don't remember, uh, Victor, no, I think they got this wrong, that's Victoria Island, I'm pretty sure it's Victoria Island, or maybe the city of Victoria, I don't remember, but anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if San Andreas Fault is partly responsible for 
that, and also the Gulf of California down in uh, Mexico. Like that. That is the last slide in the chapter. Okay. How are we doing time wise? It's close to 2.30 now, right? 2.25. Oh, I need to call roll. Let me do that quickly, if I can. Ed never made it in today. Okay. Tyus is still here. Uh, Cassidy is mostly here. Jessica is here. Christy is here. Chris didn't make it in today. Guy is still here occasionally. Okay. Um, Kayla didn't make it in today. Adam didn't make it in today. Justin is still here. Jordan is still here. Lauren is still here. And Jacory didn't make it in today. What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah, you may, certainly. There is one up here, and it worked earlier, but I don't know if it still is or not. It's a cranky old thing. Okay, but before, I'm sorry, I should have been uh, called the roll earlier, but I just remembered it. Let me go over a couple things. Number one, uh, people behind the science, the guy listed here, thank you, uh, is a guy named James Hutton. Okay? Uh, one of the fathers of what they call, uh, I think, chemical geography, I believe is what he's most famous for. Uh, and I can't find the actual statement here, but he, he did a lot of things. Very, very, and by the way, he was uh, supported by and, and several other people mentioned here. One being Joseph Black, William Cullen, James Watt, very famous physicist. Um, and uh, he was Scottish, I think, by nature, yeah, Scottish natural philosopher who pioneered uniformitarian ge geology. In other words, nothing major cataclysmic caused things. The same thing that's happened before is happening now, same thing that's happening now has occurred and will occur again in the future. Um, read on a little bit further, you'll see Sir James Hall mentioned, um, and uh, John Playfair, and later Charles Lyell. So many people named, many topics named, books, you know, several things, so you can get a lot of information from here. This cannot be the source for your paper, though. This can give you ideas for the paper. You have to get your source from outside the book. Okay. I say it every chapter. I'll say it again today. Nothing replaces reading the chapters. Okay? There is a nice little summary here, but the key word there is little. It's not a very big summary. So therefore, there's a lot that's being left out in the summary. The key terms, I think, probably fewer than most chapters. Okay? They're listed alphabetically, but they give the page numbers where they were first uh, mentioned, defined, or described. Applying the concepts. Now, whereas this chapter has a small summary and small key terms, applying the concept probably above normal number. 50 questions. A lot of the chapters are in the 40s. This is 50. They're true, false. The answers are given. I haven't checked all the answers, but I think you'll find, uh, I think most of them are probably correct. Probably wouldn't be surprised if all of them weren't correct. Questions for thought? Actually, maybe a few more than normal, 17. For further analysis, the normal around four. Okay? Uh, invitation to inquiry. There's a thing about earthquake patterns, so uh, that would be perhaps a good paper topic if you want to follow up on that. Then there's some parallel exercises. Uh, group A have answers in the back of the big book. I haven't found them in the thin book, so I don't know if they're there. Uh, there's 15 of each group. Uh, they're more quantitative 
and certainly it's that part is important but I think the uh, most of what your test will be will be qualitative okay now say again I can't hear you okay the test will be more qualitative not quantitative okay maybe a little bit uh, which brings us okay since we finish the chapter today but don't have time to do the lab today the lab will be probably the last two hours of class on Thursday okay that will be from 1 30 to 3 30 it won't take you a full two hours but I'll give you at least a full two hours to do it it's kind of a fun lab uh, it's going to be one you'll be determining latitude and longitude from of cities all over the globe okay I've got uh, no we'll do it in class okay uh, otherwise I'll keep teaching okay and you won't have to do the lab okay no I think you'd rather have time to do the lab now notice I said the lab would be the last two hours with nothing allowed for the test and here's why I said that because this chapter in the test bank that they provided and I haven't checked the new one but the old one I found the questions in this chapter to be pathetically obscure okay they either were testing you on questions that I thought what difference does that make anyway or they were twisted in such ways that they could be interpreted a couple different ways so I just had to make up my own and it's not multiple choice it is actually fill in the blank and because it's fill in the blank uh, I decided to go on and let you have a look. Yeah, take home test. Okay, and this is the one and only that you'll have this way in this term. But uh, it's just a one page test. There's only 10 questions, but there's multiple parts. Okay, so it turns out being 18 to, to 20 individual answers, but there will be multiple. Like I said, I found there the way they worded things in the test bank was just I found awful so here is a test you can take it home you can use at least a week to work on it okay the reason I say that if there's anything you don't understand about it you can come in Thursday and say hey I don't understand what this is asking for or, or what do you mean by this that kind of stuff I won't answer the questions but I'll try to describe it for you if you find something in the book similar to it like one of the applying concepts or other questions, I'll answer anything from the book that doesn't directly answer this same question. Okay? So here it is. It's, uh, like I said, only 10 questions, but there are multiple parts to many of those questions. Let's go. Have one to tie us. Uh, yes, you, you need to have sources. I have a question. Yeah. So, do I want to turn up the paper? You can have your book up if you want. No, I'm saying, like, the answer is going to be short or it's going to be long. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Usually, the, okay, I see what you're asking now. Usually, they're one to three words uh, or phrases. There's nothing going to be super long. This okay. is not discussion questions. Okay. Yeah, these are just, you should be able to find words, terms, expressions, or something that's going to, that you, okay, maybe my lines aren't quite long enough, but they're going to be pretty close. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for instance, number one, I'm really looking for you can either express it in one word or maybe no more than three words three words might be go off the line but that's fine you've got plenty of room um, number two basically about a one word answer will do you might be able to express it in more than one three types of uh, number three uh, generally one word answers will do but you might find ways to express it in more than one word 
Um, number four, pretty much one word answer. Uh, you might, might, all these, you might find ways to express it in other one. Um, five, two individual words is how I would answer it. Um, and six, about the same one word there, one word. Uh, to seven, you could do maybe more than one, but uh, two types of faults, and I think we've mentioned both of them in the thing, but again, reading the book, that's a big key here. Uh, and then number nine, we talked about a, an example in the book, but very similar to that one. And then number 10, we just went over, and those are generally one word, uh, things, there are actually six given in the book, I asked for only five of them, okay? So, pretty straightforward. Uh, if you had seen the questions from the test bank, I think you'd appreciate the fact that this is condensing. It. There were a lot of true-false, and the true-false questions stink. Uh, so I just was not a happy camper when I read what they had. All right, so we've still got about an hour to go, right? So let's get started on chapter 20, which follows very, very, I mean, it's so related to chapter 19 that it's just, all these chapters are related pretty much to one another. So let me get out of this and into chapter 20. Damn PowerPoint taking a long time to open. Okay, here we go. Okay. Woo. Chapter 20. Chapter 19, we built the Earth's surface. In chapter 20, we're going to be talking about how the Earth's surface has been shaped. Okay? Anyone got an idea, or guess about what this may be? Grand Canyon. Second? Grand Canyon. And I would be at all surprised if that's not the Grand Canyon. If it's not the Grand Canyon, it's some canyon similar to it. Okay? Um, and what this indicates to you, I think we had a picture very similar to this in chapter, possibly chapter 17, when we talked about sedimentary rock. These were obviously sedimentary rock. Why do I say obviously? You can see the layers. The layers are there, okay? Uh, most other rocks don't form layers like this. These are sedimentary rocks. Different sediments in different time periods. The newer sediments are these on top. The older ones are then here, go down and down. And therefore, the Grand Canyon enables us to study layers that were formed hundreds of thousands of years ago. Okay? because there's so many, it's such a deep, 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 deep canyon that you can go down and say, well, this is about this time, that was about that time, that was, you know, and they can study results of that, okay? Now, what has made this happen? Erosion. Erosion has eaten away, and it was mostly water erosion. Uh, some of this could have been some glacial erosion way back in the past, but most of this is water erosion. What you see left are the harder rocks, the softer rocks have all washed away years ago. Okay? You'll see some very jagged edges here. That's what leads me to think it might be a little bit of uh, glacial erosion, because that's pretty common there, but it can still be water erosion as well. Okay? But anyway, this is these are all parts of shaping the Earth's surface. Okay. The core concept here, which is also on page uh, 505, the surface of the Earth 
is involved in an ongoing process of destruction and tearing down of higher elevations. It's constantly happening. The higher elevations are being worn away, eaten away, falling away, they're falling down, and whereas in the last chapter we saw how they were being built up. Folding, faulting, yes. So you were going, you were going to say, so I'm happy with, say that again? I was asking how you were going to Yes. This okay, is good Okay. All right. So the last chapter told how the Earth's surface was being built up. This is how it's being worn down. Okay. Does anyone know what this is? This picture here. So it's a waterfall, definitely. Okay. Any idea where this waterfall might be? Second. No, it's not Niagara. Niagara is a big, wide waterfall. Well, a dam. Say again? That's a dam. It's a natural dam. It's not one that's man built. And I'll give you a hint. What color is this stone over here? Sort of. Beige. Beige, kind of. Give it more primary color. Kind of. Oh. Okay, a little more primary than that. Oh. Right. Say again? Yellow. Yellow. This stone is yellow. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yellowstone National Park. Okay. Uh, that is exactly. Now they have two of these. This is the Yellowstone River, by the way. And they have two of these waterfalls. One is called Upper Yellowstone Falls and one's Lower Yellowstone Falls. And I can't tell for certain which this is. I think this is the Upper Falls. We've been there a couple of times. My wife has taken a picture that looks just about like this. I know exactly the overlook that, that the photographer was on when he took this picture because that's what she wants to see with hers. Um, and I just don't remember whether this is Upper or Lower. But guess what? The Yellowstone River has been roaring down this valley for centuries, possibly millennia, okay, for a long, long time, okay? Now, when it started, there was a plain up here somewhere, level, fairly level, maybe a little bit unlevel plain. The river started running and started eating away at that soil that made up that plain, and eating away at the softer rock that made up the plain, and digging its trenches, the same way the Colorado River did in, in Grand Canyon, it's doing here. I want to point something out to you. Notice how the sides are very steep and V-shaped, okay? That means this is a very young formation. Like I said, it may be centuries, millennia, or whatever, Geologically, it's very young. And I'll tell you where the toughest, hardest rock around are, right up there. Okay? It took, that's why it hasn't worn down so much, because this is very hard rock there. But at one time, that waterfall was further back and higher. Okay? But it's worn down and worn down and worn down. It's just this is more resistant rock. This rock down here ate away in just a few hundreds of thousands of years. That's taking a lot off, and that's what makes a waterfall. It is a dam, but it's a naturally occurring dam. Nothing, nothing that man built there. Okay. All right, I guess I'll beat that to death. So let's look at some of the concepts here. 2.1, 20.1, I'm sorry, says weathering, erosion, and transportation. Okay, now uh, I was a soil science by training, and we used to talk about these same same type of uh, well, no, I guess mostly in erosion. So they're sort of mixing up some things. What you have here are two processes: one is detachment, and the other is transport. They mentioned two weathering and erosion, 
To me, those are almost, not quite the same, but they're, they're very closely related. That's the process of detaching, breaking apart a material. That's the weathering, okay? Erosion is the hauling off of that broken material. Transport is the hauling off of that, okay? So that's what 20.1 basically is one paragraph, and it talks about those three. 20.2 takes the first one of those, weathering, okay? Now this is sort of a generic word, and the reason they call it weathering is most of it is fairly natural. It just happened in the weather, okay? Um, these are slow, slow changes resulting from the breakup, that's detachment, crumbling, or other destruction of solid rock. Okay? The naturally occurring, very slow changes of the breakup, crumbling, or otherwise destruction of solid rock. Now, they mention three different processes that contribute to those naturally occurring breakup, crumbling, and otherwise destruction of solid rock. Physical weathering, which in the next slide they're going to call mechanical weathering, means the same thing. Chemical weathering, meaning something slightly different, and biological weathering, which they don't say much about. I'll give a little bit more perhaps than they do. Okay? Now, if you think back to chapter 17, when we talked about the rock cycle, remember the igneous rock, the metamorphic rock, or even sedimentary rock, were then worn away and then formed sediments and formed more sedimentary rock or other stuff. Okay? So the rock cycle is certainly part of this process. This process contributes to the rock cycle. Does this sound like a good thing, a bad thing, or a neutral thing? The breakup, crumbling, and otherwise destruction of solid rock. Would you say that's good, bad, or indifferent? It depends on the outside afterwards. What's that? It depends on the outside afterwards. The outside thing. Okay. So, okay. Um, if you were the rock, you'd probably think it was a bad thing. Hey, they're wearing away at my outside, okay? They're stripping me away, okay? But frankly, because of this, it's a very good thing. If we didn't have some way to break up, crumble, or otherwise destroy the solid rock, we wouldn't have soils. If we don't have soils, we don't have plants. If we don't have plants, we don't have animals. We don't exist. We depend on this process, okay? And unfortunately, our soils get eroded away, so we need new soils. So yeah, this process, this cycle, this whole situation is necessary, okay? Now, this also contributes to the movement of rock materials over the Earth's surface, okay? That's sort of a grandiose big concept that they really don't do a whole lot with until a little bit later. Okay? So, weathering in some senses could be a little on the negative side, but also has some very positive aspects. Breakup, crumbling, and otherwise destruction of solid rock. So when it's forming soils or different rocks, that's probably a pretty good thing. When it's eroding, however, I can't think of much of that is good here. This is almost always a negative concept. It's the process of physically removing that re re uh, weathered material. Not good, okay? Because that weathered material is what we grow our food on, okay? And if that's being eroded away, we are in serious problems. Now let's go back. The Grand Canyon, that's the result of erosion. Surely that's a magnificent, magnificent, beautiful evidence of nature at work. So in that sense, yeah, there may be some positives there, but by and large, that destroyed a lot of land, a lot of land. The great um, uh, 
the valley that the Yellowstone River runs down. It's beautiful, it's fantastic, it's incredible looking, but that was erosion that created that, which is not usually something I want to celebrate. Okay? And we'll talk later in the chapter about different types of erosion. So we're going to start off with these three concepts, even they're going to focus on just two. And like I said, they say the first of these is physical weathering, which on this slide they call mechanical weathering. Those two things mean the same. Physical and mechanical mean the same. And they say right here, the physical breakup of rocks without chemical change. Okay? That would be like um, have you ever seen a company uh, say at some major downtown building or something like that that has gotten all mildewy and ugly and they come in and sandblast it you might have seen people do it to your uh, driveway or sidewalks. They actually go in and, and put high pressure, usually sometimes air, sometimes with sand particles in it, that's why you get the name sand blasting, sometimes with high energy water or even steam, and they sand blast it away. As long as it's a physical breakup without chemical change, that is physical weather, mechanical weather. Okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll do some, all right, here's, here's the disintegration processes. Here's a couple of these. No physical, no chemical change happening, only physical change. Here's one. Now, these are less common down here in the south, but they do occur. The first of these is wedging, okay? Now, that's not what you do to your younger brother. You know, that, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, this is... One of these is by frost. Oh, I can see you've done it. Okay, go ahead. All right. Shame on you. Okay. Okay. Frost is one way that this occurs. And I'll show you the picture. And here's what happens. And not, again, not frequent and not prevalent here in the southeast. But here you have a rock and you have plenty of rainfall and stuff like this. And the rock has got little cracks and fissures in it for one reason or another. And water runs down into that fissure or crack and fills it up, or largely fills it. Okay? The water by itself is not going to hurt it. Okay? We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what if then comes a very cold night? Now, water is one of the most prevalent substances on the face of the earth. More than two thirds of the earth's surface is covered with water. So it's all over the place here. And yet it's one of the most unusual materials on the planet. One of the things that makes it very, very unusual is the fact that unlike just about every other substance on the planet, when you cool water, when you cool anything, it tends to decrease its volume. And that's true of water up to a point. But when you get to four degrees Celsius, which is around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and you continue cooling it, it actually starts expanding. How do you know that's true? Huh? Yes, and it acts about everything does. Every liquid, if you cool it enough, it turns into a solid, but most of those solids are smaller in volume than the liquid was, but not water. What's in your cup like that? Liquid. Huh? Liquid. Just liquid, or is there any? Ice. There is ice. And when there's ice in the liquid, where does the ice go? To the bottom. Really? No. It, it, it floats. Oh. Right? Isn't it on top? Yeah. And the liquid's on the bottom. Why is that? Because ice is less dense than water. It floats. The just about the only substance known to man that when it cools, it swells rather than shrinks. Okay? And when that water cools in that rock, 
it actually swells and pushes out in the water, wedging it, and this is frost and ice, pushing it outward, ultimately strong enough to make the rock fall off. Almost unbelievable. But then, too, now well, this past winter, we have some neighbors up at Smith Lake that said, and the very coldest weather they had this winter, their water lines burst in their little room they had on the other side of the garage and they had just finished redoing the bathroom and everything in there. Now we got to do it all over again because of water damage. Why? Because water, when it cools, it swells enough to break metal pipes. Isn't that unusual? It's that strong of a force. It's strong enough to break rock off. That's the wedging we're talking about here. The wedging by frost of frozen water. Creeping into the crevices and rocks, breaking them off, that's mechanical or physical weather. There's no change of chemical structure there. None. It's all physical. The process of freezing water, expanding and breaking it off. Now, this isn't quite fair to do because they combine in here biological weather, okay? Tree roots will do the same thing. And up on Smith Lake, I've seen it several times, you'll see a pine tree just growing up there on the rock. You think, what, how in the world, where are its roots? And if you look down, the roots are all over inside the rock. Well, what has happened? And this isn't quite fair because this isn't strictly mechanical weather. This is biological and also, to some extent, chemical weather. Because I'll tell you what happens. Those tree roots, they start off as tiny, tiny, almost invisible. They call them root hairs. They're so thin, they're about the thickness of your hair. I don't have much, but you know, they're you know, very, very small. And those roots, root hairs, find these little crevices in the rock, okay? They penetrate there. Now the rock is usually made up of pretty good minerals, okay? Not all rock, but some are. And what they do, these little tree roots, they secrete an acid, and the acid dissolves the rock. And then they pull up nutrients from the rock and then make a place for water to get in and freeze and stuff and in conjunction with those and then the tree roots grow and fill that little thing they send out more acid and eat away at the rock and they are soon wedging the rocks and you can actually see places that the tree roots are just growing inside rock that's how they got there it's tiny little root hairs but that's also not just mechanical it's also biological and chemical to some small extent but the Growth of the roots, that's physical. They grow and push the rock apart. Now, I would be very surprised if y'all hadn't seen this in driveways and sidewalks. Our, whoever built our house, uh, was built in the, started being built in the 19, 29 or so, and it was finished in 1930. So it's a pretty old house, okay? What is 80 years old in a couple of years? So, you know, 90 years old in a couple of years, okay? Uh, so, when they first built the house, there was this oak tree between our house and the next house, right next to our driveway. The same oak tree is still there but it is much bigger and that oak tree roots have lifted parts of the driveway concrete slab of the driveway so you have to sort of work your way around backing in and coming in and out to miss the tree roots they've lifted big pieces of the concrete now that's not rock but that's the same type thing they've broken off corners of that Tree roots will do the same thing. That's wedging by tree roots. Now, another type of mechanical or physical weathering is exfoliation. 
Now, you ladies may do this. I don't know. I don't mess with it. But, you know, exfoliating. Is that a, a uh, process that some materials like pumice and things like this, they pull off the, left, the outer layers of skin that are sort of there? Well, exfoliation happens with rock. Now, I mentioned Stone Mountain earlier, okay? Some of you have been there, right? Stone Mountain was probably not a mountain at one time, and the uh, it may be a battle lift where the magma has come to the surface and pushed things up way underneath, pushed things up, and the top part gets stretched, okay? Now, the stretching is two things. First, you got more pressure underneath and less pressure on top. So that is going to tend to flake stuff off at the top. The other thing you've got is features caused by expansion of underlying rock and pushing up this so the upper crust and layers get stretched this way. And then they fall apart. And I mentioned Salt Mountain because I I know I've been there a time or two, but I've seen many pictures of it. And what you see all around Stone Mountain is gravel. All around Stone Mountain is gravel. Here's why. This is gravel that came as that rock was being pushed up, and maybe a little bit of wedging has occurred, but the surface has been stretched, plenty of cracks occur, uh, and it weakens, and then the... Uh, Reduced pressure effect and the fractures caused by expansion of underlying rock break these off, and then lots of little rocks are falling all at the base of them. That happens every time you have an extrusion like that. Okay? So that's exfoliation, is another example of physical or mechanical weathering. No chemistry, no biology involved here, just physical changes. Okay? Here's an example, and I've mentioned this. When this sidewalk was laid, it was nice, level, and flat. This tree was much smaller back then. The tree had grown and broken, pushed off, forced off that piece of concrete. Now, that's not rock, but that's man-made, but you can see it happen. Here, these tree roots have actually wormed their way, wedged their way in between the rock, into the rock, into crevices in the rock, and continue to grow, forcing the rock further and further apart. That's wedging. Okay? Make sense? Like I say, that's more biological than it is physical, because the tree roots are living things, but also it's a little bit of a uh, chemical, because the tree roots do ex exude uh, acid. That eats into the rock. Okay, but the pushing apart of the rock, that's the physical part. Okay, the picture in your book on page 507, the piles of rock and rock fragments around the mass of solid rock is evidence the solid rock is slowly crumbling away. The solid rock that is crumbling to rock fragments is the, in the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona. You see lots of little rock around big rock outcroppings. Okay. Moving on to chemical weathering. This will be about page 509. Okay. Uh, they have a couple of other really interesting pictures in the book. I'll let you look at those. So what do we mean by chemical weathering? Well, something changes in the actual structure of the rock. Not just a pushing apart, which is a physical or mechanical process, but actually something happens to the actual core material of the rock by chemical reactions. And they list three of these here. Um, I'll give you some slightly different terms to go with this. The first they say is oxidation. Okay. I uh, hope you'll realize that is uh, just like we say reactions of oxygen. And oxygen is a very reactive element. 
it'll combine with just about anything in some shape or form. Okay? In fact, if it wasn't for those green plants out there, we could not live on this planet because those green plants take carbon dioxide out of the air and release oxygen. If it weren't for that, the oxygen that's in the air would all be tied up with other materials and we wouldn't be able to breathe. We would literally, well, we wouldn't even be here. Okay? So oxygen is very reactive. It'll react with anything. It'll react with rock material, uh, anything. One example of this, and you've probably seen this before, any of you ever have an old car that the paint job got scratched up a little bit and soon that car wasn't blue anymore it was more yeah definitely dull and that's mostly oxidation but if it got to the metal rust it turned reddish okay red tints because when oxygen combines with oxygen iron combines with oxygen it forms rust basically a red iron oxide. Actually, there's two types of iron oxides. Now, I can't remember if I mentioned this before in this class or not. One is a red oxide. This is ferric oxide. That's high oxygen content. The other is a lower oxygen content called ferrous oxide. And it's more of a dull gray bluish color. Do you have any of that around? Every one of us does. I think I mentioned this when we were talking about photosynthesis of chlorophyll before. That same kind of structure that you have uh, that makes chlorophyll is a claw-like structure that has a magnesium ion in the middle of it. That's why magnesium is an important plant part. We talked about this with the uh, dolomitic limestone rather than calcitic limestone. Because Magnesium is a dolomite, and that's, that's important. Well, that same claw-like structure, almost identically the same organic claw-like structure, if it has an iron in here, we call that hemoglobin. Make it ring a bell. Hemoglobin is the feature in your blood that carries oxygen from your lungs to your body parts so you can talk, you can listen, you can move your fingers, you can do whatever you want to do, think that comes about by oxidation of the sugars, the starches, the proteins, the fats that you ate for lunch today and breakfast this morning and stored and whatever, that all happens because of oxidation. Well, when the blood has not gotten to the lungs yet, what color is that blood? You see it in your veins. Blue. Blue. Why? Because that blood is low iron oxide, I mean low oxygen iron oxide, the ferrous oxide, that's the blue venal blood. That This is the blood returning to the heart, that then from the heart is going to go to the lungs, and then come back to the heart and be pumped throughout the body. Okay? That is the blue deprived oxygen of oxygen. The, ferrous oxide blood. But once it hits the lungs, what does it become? Red. Because that's the red iron oxide. That's the ferric oxide. One is Fe2O3. Three oxygens for every two iron. The other is FeO, one oxygen for every one iron. So high oxygen oxide. Okay? So that happens in our body. It happens other places. Now, I, th I can't remember if I've told this, probably not yet. This is usually where I tell this story. My, the old house plate, not, not that old, but you know, house that my parents built when I was in the second grade, uh, and that's where my sister currently lives, her place on the farm. Um, the field beside that was a hill, and Boy, when we plowed or cultivated that hill, bright red clay. I mean, really bright red. Down at the base of that hill, it was getting into a swampy area, and it was gray down there. 
And it was really stark, the redness of the hill up here and the grayness of the hill down there. I always thought it was called the sand that washed off the hill into the low area and, you know, it didn't have much color to it. I found out later, no, that was still a clay down there too, just like it was clay up here. But the difference is this high aerated, in other words, got lots of oxygen exposed to that bright red oxide here, down here where it was sort of swampy and wet, low oxygen. It was ferric oxide, just like it here on the hillside in the arteries, ferrous oxide down in the low part. Same thing happened. So oxygen combines with lots of things, and for instance, a strong piece of metal, it oxidizes in rust, not strong anymore. So that oxygen combining with rock material can weaken, really weaken that. That's a type of chemical weapon. Carbonation, okay? Now, this is one, oh wait, wait, let me go back to oxidation. Anytime you have oxidation, there's a counter operation that's going on, it's called reduction. Oxidation is getting more oxidized, reduction is getting less. It deals with the valence of the chemical reactions going on, the valence going up or down, down is reduced, oxidized is increased. So uh, this really, I think, should be oxidation reduction. Because both of those processes are involved with chemical weapons. In fact, you can't have one without the other, okay? The carbonation. Now, again, I have a little disagreement here. It says reaction with carbonic acid. And let me express to you what carbonic acid is. Okay? Basically, carbonic acid is CO2, good old carbon dioxide, plus H2O, water. This produces H2CO3. That's carbonic acid. Anything that starts with an H pretty much is going to be an acid. Okay? Especially inorganic compounds. The part with an H is going to be acid. HCl is hydrochloric acid. HS, HS is sulfur. Sulfur. Hydro. Sulfur. Goodness, I can't think of the uh, Hydrosulfuric acid. Okay? Uh, H2SO4 is sulfuric acid. So anything that starts with H is usually an acid. This is an acid, carbonic acid. That's what they're talking about here. That's carbon dioxide dissolved in water, just what I've written here, okay? Now, they act as if this is the only acid reaction you have. No, it's not, okay? SO2, sulfur dioxide, combined with H2O forms H2SO3. That's sulfurous acid. A, as strong an acid as a carbonic acid is. NO2 combined with H2O creates, this isn't exactly the reaction, but ultimately gets to HNO3. Okay? Okay. No, that'll be exact. That's no, it's not exact because you have another H you have to deal with. But anyway, that's nitric acid. That's one of the strongest acids out there. Okay. And guess what? Every time it lightens, nitrogen from the air is combined with oxygen from the air, and you form some type of nitrous oxide. And that then, when it combines with water, which lightning usually involves rain then you get nitric acid. So there's lots of acids there. So what I call, what they call carbonation, okay, so I'm going to do this. Oxidation reduction, that's a pair. Carbonation or the better word would have been acidification. It's a longer word, but it actually describes what's going on. It doesn't have to be carbonic acid. Any of these acids will react with your rock and wear it away. They say easily dissolves limestone. Absolutely true. Okay? 
In fact, if you have, in fact, I bet you some of you noticed this when you did your uh, lab that had to do with the uh, properties of uh, common minerals. Remember that when you did it on the computer? I think you probably saw a couple of places. I think calcite was one, and probably a couple of others that said bubbles or fizzes when you add vinegar or something like that, or add an acid. I know some people wrote that down on their thing, so I know some people saw that uh, in the thing. Anything that that's happening, that is limestone. That it has to do. Limestone, if you drop a drop of vinegar on limestone, you probably are going to see it bubble some. What it's doing is the reverse of this. Uh, the acid is breaking down the limestone and making carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so it's a, uh, that's how, those are chemical reactions. So any acid that hits limestone or even marble is going to very slowly dissolve it away. We have marble countertops in our ha home. Uh, when my wife wanted to redo the kitchen, I thought, mm, okay. Uh, but then when she said, I want more marble countertops, I said, all right, because I love marble. It's just such a beautiful stone to me. Well, they say, be careful, don't let any acid, like coffee, orange juice, anything else, stand on limestone because it's going to pit it over time. And sure enough, it's taking some of the shine off of it, but it still is. Okay? But any acid is going to dissolve limestone. It doesn't have to be carbonic acid. Okay? And then the other thing, hydration. Now, you might not think of this as being a chemical reaction, but it is. It's reactions with water itself. Okay? Now, let's go back up here to the red iron oxides. When does metal tend to rust the worst? When it's wet. When it's wet, exactly. Water sometimes doesn't have to react to something. It acts as a... Uh, catalyst that makes other reactions happen more easily. That's what it does with iron. It acts as a catalyst making iron rust more easily. Okay? So uh, water is in many ways one of the most active chemicals we have. And any reaction with water is called hydration. It's not just replenishing your body fluids with water. That's what we usually call hydration. Any reaction with water is hydration. Uh, that includes dissolving in water or dissolving by water, combining with water. Okay? Now I need to clear my slide here because it's going to show some figures here. And we're going to see some of these at work. Okay? Now, it's really hard to tell what they're talking about here, but in both conditions here, this is a limestone ridge here, okay? And water with some carbonic acid, maybe sulfuric acid, maybe uh, hydrochloric acid, maybe nitric acid, some type of naturally occurring acid has gotten in, and you see there are places here in this limestone wall where the water has eaten away the softer limestone because of that. Carbonation or acidification are also hydration. Both of these are active. Okay? They act together. Okay? Carbonation or acidification because the water by the way, by the way, you probably have heard people refer to acid rain. Okay? That usually occurs near highly industrial areas. Okay? where they do a lot of burning of fossil fuels. And you've got lots of carbon dioxide in the air, but also fossil fuels give off sulfur oxide, they give off nitrogen oxide, and then you have rain mixing with that, then your water, the rainfall, becomes more acid because of that acidification process. It's not just carbonic acid, though that's one. It may be the major one, but it's not just carbonic acid, that's acidification. 
and then that very acid rainfall falls on trees, falls on rocks, falls on other things, and actually will sometimes kill trees if it's too high of acid. And that happened a lot in uh, the Midwest back before they had EPA and you know, air quality control. Factories were dumping out just tons of really bad stuff. The rainfall would hit, go downstream from there, and some portions of Ohio, uh, probably Tennessee, you know, some area that were beautiful forest, the trees died because of that acid rainfall. It happened big time over in Europe, especially in the Soviet Union at the time. They had absolutely no control of what they were pumping out. They didn't want any control, and they killed huge swaths of trees, some of them in Europe. Germany had, and Germany was also producing a lot of uh, bad stuff too, but just huge forests would die because of the acid rainfall. Okay, so it's not good stuff. That's partly acidification or carbonation, but also reactions with water. Now, if it's not, uh, what I was going to say is all rainfall is slightly acidic. You know, perfectly neutral would be 7.0. Most rainfall is going to be probably between 5.5 and 6.5. Slightly acidic pH, okay? Not anything super bad, but wherever it happens, it will dissolve uh, material. This is probably also limestone here, and the water has dissolved the easily soluble limestone, and it's just going on downstream. That's how that water bed is eaten out, mostly by hydration. Reactions with water, including dissolving in water, or dissolving by water, combining with water. Now, have you heard in California, especially in those areas that were hit by wildfires, how the next spring, when they had the spring rains, they have mudslides, okay? That's reaction with water, too. The soils that they have in California, a lot of them are clays that are what they call swelling clays. They have these down around Selma, uh, also the Black Belt of Alabama. That soil is very dark, rich. The reason is they have the type of clays there tend to get very dark and rich, but they're also swelling clays. We have a little bit in our areas too. Most clays will swell a little bit, but these clays will swell big time. So what happens is on those denuded hillsides where the fire has burned off all the, the uh, living material, and then the rains come and the swell and the clays swell, and they were being held together pretty tightly because they were clays, they swell and now they wash away. And that will wash away foundations under buildings, houses will slide down the hills, it's just an awful mess, okay? That is another kind of hydration. Combining with water to swell up the clays and then erode away, okay. Twenty point three is going to start soils. It's a pretty short section, but I'm wondering if we can do it in the ten minutes we have. I really appreciate the faithfulness of the three of you staying with it this long, but you want to just call it a day, and we will uh, pick up with soils next time, because uh, soils is my my area. I love talking about this, so I'm probably going to go more than two minutes on this. So we will, let's stop here. Sorry to cheat you out of 10 minutes of your tuition dollar, but really we didn't have that big of a break. You know, we should have had a 10 minute break. Yeah, it was a little shorter. We did do. So it was a little shorter than that, so I think we'll do. And this will also help me get over to the other campus a little sooner. I just about, What's that? 27, I mean a trio support group 
and we want to do all of this. Oh. Do I just get credit for me instead of being a lost state? And what? Yeah. Do I get credit? Okay, do I need to bring something? You don't need to bring anything. I mean, I have to count you absent because you're not here, uh -huh. but that's why I record everything so you can okay. follow it. Okay. <laughs> What schools are doing that? Is that? It's just like three or four universities. They just want to go down. Yeah. And, um, I went to Xavier for a meeting. Xavier University. That's one of the it, really it, nice. That's one of them. I bet you I wouldn't be surprised. They're just trying to get students to just yeah. come down. Now. Which I don't do the tutoring because I was with one of the girls and she literally had to do like homework for her from one all the way down to fifth and I was like, Oh my goodness, I can't do this. You gotta do your work and they actually brought the, the whole math book and she literally had to sit her work to the side and do it and then as soon as one get through she got like four more people sitting in the door, I was like, Nah, y'all can keep that part. Oh wow. <laughs> So I'm just doing the fun part. I like my community service. That's All right. Service. <laughs> All right. We'll, so we what's that? Yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do chapter 20 for the first hour and a half approximately from 12 to about 1.30. And then we'll do loud from 1.30 to 3.30. Right, cool. yeah. It won't take you that long, uh, but that will be what we do. And it's... It's kind of a fun lab. I actually have eight cups from different continents, and you pick out randomly pick out cities, and I have atlases and other things here. You look up the cities and find their their latitude and longitude. Yeah. So it won't take long, and it's kind of fun. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Yeah.